the palace still shook occasionally as the earth rumbled in memory, grown as if it would deny what had happened. Bars of sunlight cast through rents in the walls made most of dust glitter where they yet hung in the air. Scorch marks marred the walls, the floors, the ceilings. Broad black smears crossed the blistered paints and gilded once bright murals. Soot overlaying crumbling friezes of men and animals which seemed to have attempted to walk before the madness grew quiet. The dead lay everywhere. Men and women and children struck down in attempted flight by the lightnings that had flashed down every corridor, were seized by the fires that had stalked them, or sunken into stone of the palace, the stones that had flowed in salt, almost alive, before stillness came again, in our counterpoint, colorful tapestries and paintings, masterworks all, hung undisturbed except where bulging walls had pushed them awry, finely carved furnishings, inlaid with ivory and gold, stood untouched except where rippling floors had toppled them, the mind twisting had struck at the core, ignoring peripheral things. Loose Theron Telemann wanted the palace, deftly keeping his balance when the earth heaved. Elena, my love, where are you? The edge of his pale gray cloak trailed through blood as he stepped across the body of a woman, her golden haired beauty marred by the horror of her last mole wife. Mance, her still open eyes frozen in disbelief. Where are you? My where is everyone hiding? His eyes caught his own reflection in a mirror hanging askew from Bub. Ed Marble, his clothes had been regal once in gray and scarlet and gold, and all the finely woven cloth, wrought by merchants from across the world's sea, was torn and dirty, thick with the same dust that covered his hair and skin. For a moment he fingered the symbol on his cloak, a circle half white and half black, the colors separated by a sinuous line. It meant something. That symbol, but the embroidered circle could not hold his attention long. He gazed at his own image with as much wonder. A tall man just into his middle years, handsome once, but not with hair already more white than brown and a face lined by strain and worry, dark eyes that had seen too much. Luz Thurn began to chuckle, then threw back his head, his laugh. Tur echoed down the lifeless halls. X. Elena, my love, come to me, my wife. You must see this. Behind him the air rippled, shimmered, solidified into a man who looked around, his mouth twisting briefly with distaste. Not so tall as Luz Thurn, he was clothed all in black save for the snow-white lace at his throat and the silver work on the turned-down tops of his thigh-high boots. He stepped carefully, handling his cloak fastidiously to avoid brushing the dent. The floor trembled with aftershocks, but his attention was fixed on the man staring into the mirror and laughing. Lord of the morning, he said, I have come for you. The laughter cut off as if it had never been, and Luz Thurin turned, seeming unsurprised. Ah, the guest, have you the voice? Stranger, it will soon be time for the singing and here all are welcome to take part. Elena, my love, we have a guest. Elena, where are you? The black-clad man's eyes widened, darted to the body of the golden-haired woman, then back to Luz Thurin. Shaden, take you. Does the Tain already have you so far in its grip? And that name. Shy Luz Thurin shuddered and raised a hand as though to ward off something. You mustn't say that name. It is dangerous, so you remember that much, at least. Dangerous for you, fool. Not for me. What else do you remember? Remember? You like blinded idiot. I will not let it end with you swaddled in unawareness. Remember. For a moment Luz Thurin stared at his raised hand, fascinated by the patterns of grime. Then he wiped his hand on his even dirtier coat and turned his attention back to the other man. Who are you? What do you want? Bull. The black-clad man drew himself up arrogantly. Once I was called a lie. More in Ted and I. But now, betrayer of hope, it was a whisper from Luz Thurin. Memory stirred, but he turned his head, shying away from it. Now not KR. And you do remember some things. Yes, betrayer of hope, so have men named me. Just as they named you Dragon. But unlike you, I embraced the name. They gave me the name to revile me. But I will yet make them kneel and worship it. What will you do with your name? After this day, men will call you Kinslayer. What will you do with that? Luz Thurin frowned down the ruined hall. Ilyana should be here to offer a guest welcome. He murmured absently. Then raised his voice. Ilyana, where are you? The floor shook. The golden-haired woman's body shifted as if in answer to his call. His eyes did not see her. Eli Moore grimaced. Look at you, he said scornfully. Once you stood first among the service, once you wore the ring of Tamulin, and sat in the high seat, once you summoned the nine rods of dominion. Now look at you, a pitiful, shattered wretch. But it is not enough. You humbled me in the hall of service. You defeated me at the gates of par and descent. But I'm the greater. Now, I will not let you die without knowing that. When you die... Your last thought will be the full knowledge of your defeat, of how complete and utter it if I let you die at all. I cannot imagine what is keeping Eileen. She will give me the rough side of her tongue if she thinks I have been hiding a guest from her. I hope you enjoy conversation, for she surely does. Be forewarned. 
Elena will ask you so many questions you may end up telling her everything you know. Tossing back his black cloak, Elon Warren flexed his hands. A pity for you, he mused, that one of your sisters is not here. I was never very skilled at healing, and I follow a different power now. But even one of them could only give you a few lucid minutes. If you did not destroy her first, what I can do will serve as well for my purposes. His sudden smile was cruel, but I fear Shaden's healing is different from the sort you know. He healed, loose thurring. He extended his hands, and the light dimmed as if a shadow had been laid across the sun. He blazed in loose thurring, and he screamed, a scream that came from his depths, a scream he could not stop. Fire seared his marrow as it rushed along his veins. He toppled backwards, crashing to the marble floor. His head struck the stone and rebounded. His heart pounded, trying to beat its way out of his chest, and every pulse gushed new flame through him. Helplessly he convulsed, thrashing, his skull a sphere of purest agony on the point of bursting. His hoarse screams reverberated through the palace. Slowly, ever so slowly, the pain receded. The outflowing seemed to take a thousand years and left him twitching weakly, sucking breath through a raw throat. Another thousand years seemed to pass before he could manage to heave himself over, muscles like jellyfish and shakily push himself up on hands and knees. His eyes fell on the golden-haired woman, and the rock tottering, almost falling. He scrabbled brokenly across the floor to scream that was ripped out of him dwarfed every sound he had made be her. It took every bit of his strength to pull her up into his arms. His hand shook as he smoothed her hair back from her staring face. Elena, light help me, Elena. His body curved around her to protect tightly. It sobs the full-throated cries of a man who had nothing left to live for. Elena, no, no. You can have her back, Kinslayer, the great lord of the dark can. Make her alive again, if you will serve him, if you will serve me. Luz Thurin raised his head, and the black clad man took him. Roman 12. Involuntary. Step back from that gaze. Ten years, betrayer. Luz Thurin said softly, the soft sound of steel being bared. Ten years your foul master has racked the world, and now this, I will. Ten years, you pitiful fool. This war has not lasted ten years. But since the beginning of time, you and I have fought a thousand battles with the turning of the wheel, a thousand times a thousand, and we will fight until time dies and the shadow is triumphant. He finished in a shout with a raised fist, and it was Luz Thurin's turn to pull back, breath catching at the glow in the betrayer's eyes. Carefully, Luz Thurin laid Elena down, fingers gently brushing her hair. Tears blurred his vision as he stood, but his voice was iced iron. For what else you have done, there can be no forgiveness, betrayer. But for Ileana's death, I will destroy you beyond anything your master can repair. Prepare to bar. Lolly, remember, you fool. Remember your futile attack on the great lord of the dark. Remember his counterstroke. Remember. Even now the hundred companions are tearing the world apart, and every day a hundred men more join them. What hand slew Ileana's son here? Kinslayer. Not mine. Not mine. What hand struck down every life that bore a drop of your blood? Everyone who loved you. Everyone you love. Not mine. Kinslayer. Not mine. Remember. And know the price of opposing Shaitan. Sudden sweat made tracks down Luz Thurin's face through the dust and dirt. He remembered a cloudy memory like a dream of a dream. But he knew it true. His howl beat at the walls, the howl of a man who had discovered his soul damned by his own hand, and he clawed at his face as if to tear away the sight of what he had done. Everywhere he looked, his eyes found the dead. Torn they were, or broken or burned, or half consumed by stone. Everywhere lay lifeless faces he knew, faces he loved. Old servants and friends of his childhood, faithful companions through the long years battle, and his children, his own sons and daughters, sprawled like bro, of ten dollars, play still forever, all slain by his hand. His children's faces accused him, blank eyes asking why, and his tears were no answer. The betrayer's laughter flogged him, drowned out his house. He could not bear the faces, the pain. He could not bear to remain any longer. Desperately he reached out to the true source, to tainted setting, and he traveled. Roman 13. The land around him was flat and empty. A river flowed nearby, straight and broad. But he could sense there were no people within a hundred leagues. He was alone, as alone as a man could be while still alive. Yet he could not escape memory. The eyes pursued him through the endless cap urns of his mind. He could not hide from them. His children's eyes, Ilyana's eyes, tears glistened on his cheeks as he turned his face to the sky. Light, forgive me. He did not believe it could come. Forgiveness, not for what he had done. But he shouted to the sky anyway, begged for what he could not believe he could receive. Light, forgive me. He was still touching setting, the male half of the power that drove the universe, that turned the wheel of time, and he could feel the oily taint filing its surface. The taint of the shadow's counterstroke, the taint that doomed the world, because of him. 
because in his pride he had believed that man could match the creator, could mend what the creator had made and they had broken. In his pride he had believed. He drew on the true source deeply, and still more deeply, like a man dying of thirst. Quickly he had drawn more of the one power than he could channel unaided. The skin felt as if it were a flame. Straining, he forced himself to draw more, tried to draw it all. Light, forgive me. Elena, the air turned to fire, the fire to light liquefied. The bolt that struck from the heavens would have seared and blinded any eye that glimpsed it, even for an instant. From the heavens it came, blazed through loose thurin telemen, bored into the bowels of the earth. Stone turned to vapor at its touch. The earth thrashed and quivered like a living thing in agony. Only a heartbeat did the shining bar exist, connecting ground and sky. But even after it vanished, the earth yet heaved like the sea in a storm. Molten rock found in five hundred feet into the air, and the groaning ground rose, thrusting the burning spray ever upward, ever high. From north and south, from east and west, the wind howled in, snapping trees like twigs, shrieking and blowing as if to aid the growing mountain ever skyward, ever skyward. At last the wind died, the earth still to trembling mutters of loose thur and tailmen. No sign remained. Where he had stood a mountain now rose miles into the sky. Molten lava still gushing from its broken peak. The broad, straight river had been pushed into a curve away from the mound. Rob Tain, and there it split to form a long island in its midst. The shadow of the mountain almost reached the island. It lay dark across the land like the ominous hand of prophecy. For a time the dull, protesting rumbles of the earth were the only sound. On the island, the air shimmered and coalesced. The black-clad man stood staring at the fiery mountain rising out of the plain. His face twisted in rage and contempt. You cannot escape so easily, dragon. It is not done. Between us, it will not be done until the end of time. Then he was gone, and the mountain and the island stood alone. Wait. Then, Roman fort, and the shadow fell upon the land, and the world was riven stone from stone. The oceans fled, and the mountains were swallowed up, and the nations were scattered to the eight corners of the world. The moon was as blood, and the sun was as ashes. The seas boiled, and the living envied the dead. All was shattered, and all but memory lost, and one memory above all others, of him who brought the shadow and the breaking of the world, and him they named Dragon. From Aleth named Terran Altacamor, the breaking of the world, author unknown, the fourth age. And it came to pass in those days, as it had come before and would come again, that the dark lay heavy on the land and weighed down the hearts of men, and the green things failed, and hope died, and men cried out to the Creator, saying, O light of the heavens, light of the world, let the promised one be born of the mountain, accord into the prophecies, as he was in ages past and will be in ages to come. Let the prince of the morning sing to the land that green things will grow and the valleys give forth lands. Let the arm of the Lord of the dawn shelter us from the dark, and the great sword of justice defend us. Let the dragon ride again on the winds of time. From Chero Drynanti Calamon, the cycle of the dragon, author unknown, the fourth age.